welcome to another episode of Affiliated. And today, guys, we are going to be doing something very special. We're going to be talking about bad relationships, but not the relationships that you might have at home or with other people or might be ruining right now. We're going to be talking about a relationship with a network, one that you might have been burned with in the past. We know that a lot of people out there have had problems in the past where they, they get on a network and they try to affiliate marketing on a network and they go, oh, that was miserable. I'll never do it again. Well, if you're listening to this, by the end of it, we're going to tell you that you should do it again and give you the things to know that you, oh, sorry, the things you need to know if I can't talk today, um, to not get burned and have a great experience. We are joined, as usual, by Thomas. Oh, hi. McMahon. How are you doing today, Thomas? I'm good. I'm a little tired because Penelope was very excited for her birthday this morning, so she woke up very early. But That is understandable. Yeah. <laughs> that is understandable. It's I'm a happy excited day. for it's a happy birthday, day. too. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> so five o'clock for five, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And we also have the amazing, the wonderful, oh and we love God. when she joins us, Lauren. Lauren, how are you doing today? Really good. Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great to have her here. And Thank of course, you. They're both looking better than I do, but that is obviously an easy. You set a very pitch. low bar, Kyle. Yes, I know. <laughs> I was going to put to the um, to the podcast audience in the universe that they should vote on what I could do with my hair because I'm really like, I don't know what to do with it. It's driving me crazy. So we'll just leave it this way for the rest of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Good. Right. <laughs> so with that, so um, actually, Lauren, we wanted to bring in because one of the big things we know that you've talked to so many brands um, they get really excited when you're having a conversation. All of a sudden, they hear <laughs> networking you can't with the, <laughs> is the hair that bad. Should I go bigger? All right. Is that making more? <laughs> so, okay. um, but we have brands that will come to you and they're getting really excited and they're like, oh, this is great. And then you mentioned network and it's like their face changes yeah. as if you just brought up their ex-boyfriend so, or girlfriend. Hmm? Yeah, no progressive here. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. So walk me through. What are kind of some of the common things? What are, what are people saying when they feel like they've been burned by yeah. network? That's a good question. Um, sadly, we do hear it a lot. Uh, you know, people often feel like I've put in all this time, I've put in all these resources, I've dedicated, you know, hiring somebody to run my affiliate program, and I'm not seeing the return on my investment, rather like sales or acquiring new customers. So oftentimes that's how people feel burned. Like the networks or an agency or an affiliate has really sold them this dream, mm -hmm. and then the dream doesn't come to fruition, right? And they're kind of just... Like, I don't know if I want to do this again. I don't know, you know, if I'm I'm willing to invest my time and money. Have you guys heard this too? Can I ever love again? Can I ever love again? <laughs> you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what about you, Thomas? Have you ever heard somebody talk about their bad experiences? I was going to try and Never, think Star Cross no. Lovers, yeah. but I don't know if that's the right term. <laughs> Just makes me think Taylor Swift. This no, is a Taylor Swift album they wrote. <laughs> yeah, it comes up quite a bit, right? It's like, oh, we tried it. It doesn't work. Like burned, sometimes is a strong word. It might just be like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work for us. We tried it before. Yeah, or sometimes it's, no, that went terrible. And usually if it goes terrible, something actually went wrong in the sense of no scale. It's something like there was no transparency on the network and affiliates were doing something shady that they didn't like, mm -hmm. or there was money that was missed or money that people fell out of, right? So those kind of things have gone wrong, yeah, in a variety of number of ways, but yeah. give people a bad taste in their mouths and go, no, we're anti-affiliate marketing now. Mm -hmm. We don't want to touch it anymore. Then we yeah. start exploring more just performance marketing. They can just start to perk up their ears and go, okay, well, like, maybe maybe this can work for me. <laughs> maybe I can find love again. Yes, yeah. maybe so. It's like, well, if that's yeah. what love looks like, maybe, maybe. But, <laughs> but let's, have, let's actually break it down first and go back to, I think the first one is like, and we'll kind of break down some of these burns, we'll call them, or situations where working on a network can go wrong. And mm -hmm. we've seen it go wrong. And honestly, we've even seen it go wrong on our platform. Top so reasons let's, why you break up with your network. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Top reason break up with your network. So one of the big ones, I think you are right, it's you get promised this idea of just greener pastures. It's a perfect situation. Do nothing, build it, and then all of a sudden affiliates just magically make you money. They're just they're just grabbing. And you just mm -hmm. it's like being in one of those tunnels where you're grabbing cash. That's what they <laughs> think affiliate marketing is gonna be. You set it up, you pay somebody, whatever it is, and you watch zeros every single day, empty clicks waiting for something to happen. Um, the pennies that you make just fill you with frustration. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things, let's, let's kind of dissect that and talk about why does that happen? What, what's occurring there? What's going wrong well, in I think, that situation? Happen? Yeah, I think one, one of the things that is like a common belief, especially when a network or talking about a network is, I will sign up and join the network. And then like you're saying, like affiliates will come to mm -hmm. my brand. And so that is often uh, the belief that people have. And so when they get to the network and then they put up their account or they're paying the fees to join the platform um, and then they do not receive any connections to any affiliates, that to them is like a burn or a waste of their time. So I don't know. I, 
Have you experienced that with other people talking to you about that? A hundred percent. I think we experience it with people launching on ClickNick every yeah. day. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I think I think I Thomas, had, yeah. it's like called the field of dreams fallacy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, people are like, oh, I thought you had hundreds of thousands of affiliates. Like, why aren't they promoting my offer? Yeah, kind of thing. Right. And what that, do you say to that person? Well, I try to if I'm chatting with someone, I try to set very realistic expectations from the get go. So ideally, they're not shocked when that happens because um, and. Right. Everyone has to market their services, which networks do as well. Affiliate networks are going to trounce how many affiliates they have and how much money they make and how many customers they drive to brands and things like that. That's how we market. Right. But the reality is that the space, just the affiliate marketing space in general, is much more competitive than it was mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years ago when it did used to be you could put it on a network somewhere and there weren't many offers out there and affiliates probably would run something on fairly low commission, but now there's just a lot more options available to affiliates. So you just have to kind of show up and really know how to network and also have that good offer. Mm -hmm. So when people are, when I have been able to set up those expectations, they are upset with that scenario. I usually start kindly asking them, oh yeah, tell me about the offer. Like, what were you doing with the hire? Like, what was your affiliate manager doing? Like, what were you doing to get traction? And they're like, I didn't have that. I don't do and that. Usually their eyes glaze over and they yeah. go, oh, well, I thought if we put it on the network, <laughs> I'm like, well, when you launched your website on Google, did you get all this traffic? When you launched your product on Amazon, did you get all these sales? And it's like, well, no, like, <laughs> we had to do all these things right mm -hmm. to grow. I'm like, well, yeah. So it's, if you want a scaled customer acquisition channel from affiliates, it's like building any other scaled customer acquisition channel. It's going to take some resources. It's going to take some know-how and knowledge. And that's where I think we, people like us can add a lot of smooth a lot of barriers over is providing that coaching and that knowledge from the get-go so you start building that and can yeah. launch quote unquote not with maybe rocket boosters but can start to build steadily and kind of build that foundation out yeah for sure and we we, we actually have some past episodes that go into detail with certain aspects of that on clickbank and other networks um, but i think one of the big things that you hit the nail on the head oftentimes it's you have to really actively work on the channel and create the channel. The, depending on down to does the offer look like what the top offers do? Sometimes people miss on something like that. Mm -hmm. It just has to look the part. Are you making the listing if it's on a marketplace appropriate? Um, and then, like I said, are you recruiting? Do you have a plan to go out and get it moving? Talk to some people. Create things like that. Um, we'll take in the latter half of this. Let's talk about some solutions that you can do to set yeah. yourself up for that success. But definitely, if you're going into a network and you felt like you got burned because you expected it to be so easy, that's that's probably a little bit of both sides. You probably you could have been oversold, but also you have to remember that you have to really actively engage it. Now, I will say it is really easy to sell the idea of affiliates as seeming like it just takes no work. <laughs> like they'll just do it all for you. And I get it. Like it sounds easy. It's easy to say it that way. But if someone's telling you, that the affiliates will just do it all and you don't have to do anything, they're lying to you. They're <laughs> gaslighting you. That's the red flags. Run away, yeah. right? You're going to get burned probably in that situation. Well, so. I would say like the counter to that a bit is that that can happen as you build traction. Like the fun, there's a lot of cool yes. stories out there, right? Where it's like, you're right. Oh, the yeah. caveat of if you have no experience in affiliates and like you've done yeah. nothing, that might be a challenge. Yeah. But when you build that out, I was chatting with a client, met up with them. Uh, it was at WebinarCon, mm -hmm. with the first WebinarCon they hosted right before COVID kicked off. And before I went out there, I was looking at his stats and saw that the big affiliate had promoted him a couple of weeks before and done very good number of sales kind of thing. And when I saw him in person, I was like, oh, man, it looks like a, that affiliate went great. Like, what was that promo like? He's like, oh, yeah, I didn't even know they were going to promote. Like, it was, they just found it on Marketplace and sent it. But he had done seven plus figures with that offer over that course of the year. But he was in that good spot in the Marketplace, had good rankings, and the offer was proven out. And this person saw it. I was like, oh, yeah, I was meant to promote that earlier. Let me get on that kind of thing. Yeah. We're going to get to that part of the yeah. solutions, Thomas, because that is a solution. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't want to yeah, just yeah, doom yeah. and gloom it, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, no, it is. That is it, the, when you build that momentum, that flywheel, things like that can happen. Correct. But to expect that to happen from the get-go is where mm -hmm. I think that, oh, this doesn't work stuff kind of. You're works, right. There you know? is a reality, and it is the power of a marketplace that dynamically does create when your offer does well, mm -hmm. moving you up that says this is something you can promote. Because, yes, I've had, I've had times with offers where super affiliates – reach out wanting to promote something they saw in a marketplace. Yeah. They're like, hey, can you get me in touch with this? And that could definitely happen. So let's move on, though, into some of the other burn or reasons you should break up with your network. So where's some? Mm -hmm. you mentioned before, too, it was, what were some of the other ones you said were things you've heard people talk about? Well, it's kind of under a general umbrella, but I was curious on how you would approach this, Lauren. It's like the, it feels like it's that lack of transparency sometimes because um, there's lots of different types of networks out there, right? Mm -hmm. There's ones where, you're kind of, you get access to all the affiliate information. They kind of mm -hmm. sign up that way. There's mm -hmm. 
kind of, I think we were kind of in the middle at ClickBank where you get access to affiliates, but you don't necessarily know directly who they are unless you're recruiting them, but we give you avenues to kind of do that. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's ones like, I guess, traditional CPA networks or CPL networks where you don't know any of the affiliates and the network's handling everything for you. Um, and kind of pushing out that way. But I think a lot of those issues of like a rogue affiliate doing something bad or not sure what affiliates are doing mm-hmm. or eating into margin with coupon kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of that comes from that like, just lack of awareness in the space or transparency into what the network's actually providing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was curious like, if you've had clients with those frustrations or come across or anything like that. I think um, most people now like expect full transparency. Mm-hmm. So it's like even in a, on our network, like when an affiliate is promoting them, they want to know who is that, how do I contact them, how do I re- you know, strategize with them. So I think in just in my experience, people need transparency of like who's actually promoting them to safeguard their brand. A lot mm-hmm. of people are often thinking about brand protection, um, making sure that nobody's just going rogue and saying some unusual claims. So, yeah, I, I've definitely run into it. I don't know if it's not like a major uh, sticking point, but people are always bring up protection of the brand. I don't know if you mean more like tracking, like actual like analytic transparency or just transparency of the affiliates. Yeah, I think that's really more on transparency, what the affiliates are yeah. doing, how they're being handled, things yeah, like that. Yeah, I think it's really yeah. important, honestly. I think yeah. it, and I mean, like if you had a brand, you'd want to know, right? Like you'd yeah. want to know who are those <laughs> affiliates. Yeah. And also even the brand we were talking to yesterday, you know, she was very due dil- doing her due diligence to see what coupon sites were running her offers and maybe if they were um, stealing or not stealing codes, but scraping codes from uh, influencers and stuff influencers like that. Right? Yeah. And people do that all the time. They'll post a code and it will go viral or it will, you know, go beyond what the intention was for the codes. So yeah, same thing like for that we were talking about. You have to be involved in any of part of the affiliate strategy, even if you're on a network, even if the network is providing transparency, it's still on you to make sure that, you know, it's making sense for your business. Yeah. You're not losing margin. You're not losing money. You're not working with affiliates you don't like. Mm-hmm. Or that are going to misrepresent your brand. So, yeah, I think yeah. That, I like you bring up that there's multiple impacts, right? There's the brand impact that could be really scary. And, you know, who knows, like, what somebody might say. Um, or devaluing customers or creating a lot of problems with customer service. So there's also the financial impacts. What mm-hmm. if somebody takes something sends a coupon that was meant to be very limited mm-hmm. and like, well, we lose money if it goes this many times and yeah. then they run it and blast it out everywhere. So, um, and we see lots of other horror stories in CPL and CPA models where I think not having protection over who could promote your product could create mm-hmm. some real bad experiences. Yeah. Those are sending at the, a lot of brands, unfortunately don't fully understand their margins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they might set a CPL or cost per lead payment or cost per acquisition payment. That's too high. Um, and they actually realize like, Oh, we can't, Float this <laughs> like we thought we could. Yeah. Or one affiliate scales and it's worse quality traffic than they were hoping, and they're actually red or negative on that affiliate versus others. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, how do you manage that? Yeah. And if it's a network doing it, there can be some delays there. The scales already happened. So do you pay? Do you not pay? How do you handle fraud that comes through? Mm-hmm. All those kind of things kind of. One of the things I really like about ClickBank, not to like, you know, what is a clickbait podcast? Yeah, 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 it's okay, like, but, this might be the place for it. <laughs> um, is that we give the control and like full agency to the brand or to the seller, right, on our platform mm-hmm. to say who they want to approve as an affiliate onto our platform. And whenever I'm talking to a brand, that's always like a deep sigh of relief. Like, okay, f- great, awesome. You know, that would be something I would. If I've been burned before, this is the protection you're providing to me and allowing me to come back onto a network. I really appreciate that. And that's not always across the board. You know, sometimes your brand is just out there for any affiliate to start reaching out to you and you might not have the bandwidth to approve them all or to review them all. So I really do appreciate that. On yeah. The platform. Yeah. Well, I think that moves into the perfect part. It was like, listen, we've we've sparked up the anger of all the hurt of the bad. <laughs> Bad experience in the past. And let's talk about how to prevent that and keep that going forward. So I think one of the big ones let's, we talked about, the brand protection, is do you have control or how are you controlling the affiliates that are promoting your product? Uh, one of the big things I see there, too, is, is you launch a business one that's like, well, I want to approve affiliates, but doesn't that mean that I get less affiliates? So as we create a wall, maybe we're not going to get the volume that we reached. Or is that really true? So in your experience, you find... Like, how are people mitigating this? And is there actually a negative impact to trying to, you know, I guess, gate 
some of the access for that's those a good affiliates. question actually i'll give you like real you know real case scenario so on it is on our platform and they have a gated offer for all the reasons we're talking mm -hmm. about like they've been on other networks they've had challenging situations before they wanted to have brand protection and so we gated their offer but allowed them to then have any affiliate who's interested in running that offer um, submit basically to get approval oh, like kind of apply through there yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um and so there's I don't know if I'm allowed to say the number, but it would there was no like fear coming into it that we would have only like a few affiliates, right? Mm -hmm. It was exponentially amount <laughs> like tons of affiliates. Well, they were like, "Whoa, too many." <laughs> you know, wanting to promote this offer, so it's almost like so now when I'm working with other brands, like I there's no concern that we won't get a lot of affiliates just cuz it's a gated offer. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes that's the off, uh, you know, they're curious, like mm -hmm. why is this gated and can I get approved? Um, I've never had the situation where it's gated and we don't have any affiliates applying. Yeah. So it's not really a deterrent to an affiliate. Yeah. And Do I you was see like, that too? Definitely. Okay. I, I always tell people, like, listen, if you have an affiliate that's not willing to apply, you probably don't want that affiliate in the there first you go. place. That's a great barometer if they're not willing to say, I like to tell you yeah. who I am and how I'm going to promote this. I'm like, you probably don't want to know who they are and how they're <laughs> mm -hmm. going to promote it. So, um, but I think one of the other questions I have you, Thomas, because I agree, having well, a sorry, can I form and a... Oh, be a Good. slight contrarian there because uh -oh. well it's not really contrarian because you make <laughs> you're, you're both right so i'm not arguing with your points it's the i think it's just addressing that you are adding friction to the process correct which doesn't mean less affiliates but does mean more overhead on how you're managing that program mm -hmm. so if you're not prepared to vet and respond and actually qualify those affiliates coming through then you're probably not going to mine and actually get the best out of those leads that are coming through your affiliate acquisition channel mm -hmm. so i we see a lot of comments on like our socials when I do top offers or trending offer videos of like, why do you keep posting, posting this offer? They're never respond to affiliates mm -hmm. and like they're applying things like that. Um, so I just say, if you are wanting to gate and are wanting to vet, that's great. Just understand that you actually have to do that <laughs> to get yeah. the affiliate traction. You actually, that's want. a really yeah. good point. And also we're referencing everything to ClickBank's network, mm -hmm. which operates very different than other networks. And so, even on another network, let's say mm -hmm. we won't have to name names, but it still requires you to mutually opt in and agree to allow mm -hmm. a publisher, an influencer, a blogger, or an ambassador to promote your products. So there's still activity that you have to participate yeah. in and mm -hmm. same on our platform. So I hope people are, if they don't have the reference points of ClickBank and some of the terminology and experiences that we're talking about, maybe that will help to pull yeah. you into the conversation. I think it goes back to the other thing we talked about at the beginning. You know, if we were, it was like a 12 step thing, it doesn't work if you don't work it, right? You have to actively <laughs> be engaging in that and be prepared yeah. to, to do it that way, all right? It's, it's yeah. trade offs. If you want the brand protection, if you want to, you know, prevent getting burned, you're going to have to put a little work in that. Now, if you want to be freewheeling and see what happens and live life on the edge, don't gate anything. Let's see what <laughs> happens, you know? Um, and that could be good or bad. It's just, it's it's those trade-offs. So with that, though, I think one of the things that could really help make it at least more efficient, and I, I think a common question I get is, how do I qualify? What should I be asking? Um, I'm always like, social, you know, firstborn name, stuff like, <laughs> no, but like, in reality, what are some of the questions that you would recommend or maybe not recommend to do um, when you're trying to build that qualification process? And For I will say that there is probably the, let, let's just put it out there, the, it depends. We all know it depends yeah, on business. Yeah. Let's give some standard best practices. For qualifying an affiliate. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. I think it ha we have to define affiliate. Sorry. Like that again, because yeah. I don't apologize. Yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. So, um, I mean, for qualifying like a publisher, just because that's my background, that would be a completely different qualification than, uh, you know, for uh, a media buying affiliate. Mm -hmm. And publisher being a... Publisher can be uh, a deal site. It can be a blogger, lifestyle blogger, somebody with um, content, uh, lifestyle content or anything like that, like basically a publication online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> that a great you're, definition, I, Lauren. Yeah. I you're going to win. Active listening. Um, yeah, so I would just say, you know, it's in, to qualify that, it's asking questions like, what is your monthly visits to the site? Can I see some content that you've created before? Am I going to work with an editor? Do I have a media contact person? What are your rate cards? Which would be like if I want to buy a placement on these, on these sites. Those are all good questions to help you uh, qualify and also get clear on if this is a, an affiliate you'd want to work with. You guys are way more savvy and <laughs> connected to our media buyers and, and email marketers. So I'll let you weigh in on how to qualify. 
Well, yeah. I'll let you jump into some specifics first. I think. Well, yeah. I think I think one of the things I think is I love what you said that I think it does depend on traffic source, but when you're putting on the page, you want to know some pretty basic information from the start. I think one of the big things, name. I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> but you want name yeah. and email. If you have a name, email for an affiliate. Yeah, for an affiliate, you want to know who they are and you want to know how to contact them. Um, crazy thing, like oh, we talked about transparency earlier. There's a lot of networks that don't want you to have direct contact, um, and some affiliates might not want you to contact them. But ultimately, it's a really powerful thing to know that this is the affiliate's name. Here's their nickname, and I have a way to get a hold of yeah, them. Yeah, nickname meaning just whatever whatever, whatever ID ID yeah. the network's yeah. using to yeah tag their essentially. And I, right, I shouldn't yeah. use clickbait, but essentially whatever yeah. that like, naming convention. Yes, there yeah. you go. I'm like struggling to come up with what it is, but. <laughs> So, so those are really key ones. And I think one of the next big ones should always be, what's your traffic source? And how can you give me an example of how you plan to promote it? I think at the base level, if that's all you're asking, you're going to get a really good sense of the affiliate. Now, you might then have follow-up questions based on specifics. They say, hey, I'm a Facebook media buyer. Yeah, let's ask some questions because they might have some requests for you. And then you could go deeper. But at a base level... Um, I've I've had this um you know even in businesses outside of ClickBank where I was starting affiliate programs we had people submit but wait that is a really telling way to know exactly what kind of traffic you're going to get and what type of affiliate you're working with mm-hmm. um like so we'd see some of the stuff and say hey we don't think this affiliate program's for you really really mm-hmm. quickly um, especially when you're looking at you're worried about some bad affiliate experiences are not intentional by the affiliate. Some of the worst things that happen in affiliate marketing are just pure ignorance. Because yeah. mm-hmm. people are just out there trying. We're just we're trying to make a book. And <laughs> sometimes trying could have disastrous effects if you're trying haphazardly. Um, so you'll see some of the stuff that people submit in and just know that is not an affiliate that is ready for your brand to be able to start promoting, have them try again in the future. But I think if you started there, that's a really good core basis. And it's not too many friction points because I've also seen people Thank you give for, yeah. like <laughs> forms and they're asking 12 to 15 to 20 questions ju- before they've even had a link or a conversation. And I, I would tell you, if I was an affiliate, um, I would not want to fill that out. I'd be like, no, thank you. That is way too much information yeah. right off the get-go, and you're just going to probably go. So there's always a balance of how much you ask for um, on the get-go to reduce you know, the friction but still qualify. Yeah. I think the, the ones I did is probably, to me, the most affiliates would be able to do that and should be able to provide that. Thomas, yeah. I have a question for you. So if somebody has like a um, – an affiliate program that's open, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. you're not asking for people to qualify through a form or through some some. We call it a swinger affiliate program. <laughs> so no. You're swinging. We got to keep the relationship thing going. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, how would you recommend to that um, seller, advertiser, brand um, to qualify those affiliates who are just kind of coming in? You don't know necessarily who they are, how they're driving traffic for you. You just you see maybe some sales coming through, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I look at the what I call the affiliate recruitment funnel, for lack of a better term, right? So typically that means you have some sort of landing page. I call it an affiliate recruitment page. So people call it affiliate tools page. But the misnomer there is that you don't you don't just want to feature. Here's all the assets. You actually want to sell and qualify and disqualify on that page. Mm-hmm. And this would apply to if it's an open offer or if it's um, gated and you need people to apply and approve. Because if you are getting a bunch of people that you wouldn't approve through your form, you're probably not disqualifying enough on that kind of page, right? And you could be saving yourself and the affiliate effort by putting in some expectations that we don't want your kind of traffic if they have that kind of traffic or yeah. volume. We didn't or talk about it terms. I probably yeah. talked. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> so yes. in that page, um, right? It's like you're kind of highlighting what the some mistakes people make is they talk to the customer or they talk too much about the product. You have to strike that balance, right? You want to talk about the product or the offer in the sense of what the affiliates gonna be curious about, right? So that does depend a little bit on the type of affiliate you're working with, but in general, what's the offer like? How much does it pay? What's the commission rate? Um, conversion stats, things like that, how they can promote, mm-hmm. right? Now we're starting about qualifying and disqualifying. You're looking for this type of affiliate that has this type of thing. Um, brands that are more omni-channel, right? I'll see them have a lander, which is more like, are you an influencer? Are you an ambassador? Performance affiliate? They almost break those out, and they have different landing pages for each one of those now to kind of right. give them different assets. Cool. Um, but from there, now you're kind of telling them the terms, I guess, right, of the program, what you're operating with. Mm-hmm. If they can't do brand bidding, if they can, if they can't do coupons, if they can't do negative keyword kind of targeting, all those kinds of things going to go into that too. 
Um, and then if they someone breaks those terms, even if it's an open offer, now you've got more, I guess, prudence to take disciplinary action, like blocking their traffic or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and a faster basis. I always push back on clients a bit when they're like, this affiliate's doing something really bad and we need to block them. I'm like, well, did you set any expectations that it was bad? No. <laughs> yeah. it's like, so you're going to punish them for them just doing what they do and they had no idea that they're breaking your terms? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so you help that happen. But if you do have those terms laid out mm -hmm. and it's clear and someone's breaking those, then yeah, you can turn off the traffic, block the traffic, then reach out to tell them why, right? But so you can nip it and then work to, on a resolution versus vice versa. Yeah. So I hope I'm answering your question there, mm -hmm. but it is a yeah. bit, yeah. Well, and I think one thing I'll mention too, because we, we do have, I mentioned before, we have a, a past episode, we went in depth on the affiliate recruitment funnel and we talk mm -hmm. a lot about that. Um, and so we'll, we'll put that in the show notes just to reference because that'll really go in depth. If you are in an open program and you want to know kind of the ideal way to build that out, uh, Thomas and I went in depth and talking about different strategies and kind of that flow um, because there is, you can be, you don't want to seem like don't promote this offer because you're like terms and like don't do this and this and this. So there's always a balance. That's, but again, yeah. for, for time's sake, I would say go back to that episode if you're looking for your resource page and, and you could dissect <laughs> and we'll give you some really, really good tips. Uh, actually, I have a question about that. You bet. Would you recommend that anybody on any network, like if you have a brand, you have an affiliate program, should you have that affiliate resource page, that affiliate tool page? Yes. So it yes. doesn't matter what network yeah. you're on. It doesn't well, matter what you're. Yeah, because I'd say re realistically, like, again, it's an advertisement for the affiliate along with a resource page. Well, I, think, well, I think what you're so kind of leaning into like, is the misconception sometimes that affiliates are going to do all the work to promote something. Yeah. Right. right? And it's like some of this, um, which is a fair assumption, I guess, right? That they're the marketer. They're the one promoting the thing. They're going to mm -hmm. make the whatever content or email or ad. Um, and most of a lot of them will. But a lot of them need some assets to get going and to jumpstart that process because they're not experts in your business, mm -hmm. right? They're not your internal sales team that has gone through training and has talked to customers and has done all this. They're right. cold to your brand to a degree, even if it's a warmer relationship that you have with someone. So having those assets where it's, this is our avatar, this is our target demographic, that helps disqualify and qualify because if you're going, this is a great offer for Midwestern women, right? And you're like, oh, I have an offer of, men in California, like that's for a list of men in California, that's probably not going to convert great. Yeah. <laughs> you can kind of come back to that relationship later if you've got yeah. an offer for that. But um, yeah, so it's the, it's having that set in place so you can point people to that when those questions pop up. I internally here at ClickBank and externally, I always like to think about what are resources you can leverage in a number of ways. And that kind of page you can leverage from a network and mm -hmm. you might duplicate that page for different networks. So you mm -hmm. can have the ClickBank one and you know share a sale one or whatever. Um, but it's also an internal resource when the question pops up for an affiliate, someone doesn't have to type out the question every time, they can send them to that resource and get them to that faster. So in theory, could they bandwidth. like promote, you know, like their affiliate mm -hmm. program outside of like like yes. you're stealing some of our stuff from our tool oh, page thing. Sorry. Or, but yes, yes, that's yeah. actually an amazing underutilized mm -hmm. strategy yeah, right? of using that as I, an yeah. opportunity for ads to so bring you're me excited because yeah, it's like yeah. really it's it's B2B marketing, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking business to business marketing here. And if you look at business, like what would you do to get in front of the right brand, which isn't at that point, it's who's the person running that brand. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the biz op, like make money online niche is way better at this than most people. They'll actually run ads to the to their affiliate page. Like, hey, like are the you- the resource page, right? To their affiliate recruitment page. Yeah, okay. right? yeah. yeah. And so they're running ads because they have a launch coming up, they're doing something cool and they're running ads to recruit affiliates because they know for every affiliate they recruit, they're going to make X thousands of dollars from that. Sure. That's qualified. Mm -hmm. So that's when we start looking at like, what are you doing on affiliate program management and recruitment strategy level? And I think a lot of people listening to this might be going, I thought networks would be doing all this for me, mm -hmm. right? Like why would I join a network if I have to do this all myself? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. That's a totally fair question, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I always like to ask a lot of qualifying questions to people of like, how do you actually want your program to work? And like, what, how do you want to manage it? And if you don't want to manage it, then okay, there's probably some done for you or CPA networks out there that will kind of try to take and push your offer and run. But if it doesn't convert, it's not going to scale, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just, you're putting it out there to those networks and shopping it out. But if you do want to manage it, if you do want this kind of control, if you're like nodding along with these questions, then I look at networks as more of like, do they reduce the overhead that running this kind of thing takes, right? Do they 
because what we haven't talked about so much right now is like affiliates that make over six hundred dollars need a ten ninety nine or you need to collect W nines and all that sort of stuff, right? Like on ClickBank, you don't have to have that happen. ClickBank, it's technically ClickBank's affiliates. We take care of that, and all the other things that come along with that. How fast you pay affiliates, um, like what thresholds and payment terms and refunds and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. can get baked into what a network does. Mm -hmm. So you can use a network like a SaaS almost. But then you're also, wow, exposed to hundreds of thousands of affiliates and all the affiliates that that network's bringing onto the platform. So you can start to mine those relationships too, plus everything you're doing. So then your affiliate recruitment efforts are multiplied, not mm -hmm. just repeated internally all the time. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I know of course. You were just about course. to ask a question, so I don't want to No, steal. no, no, you're good. Go ahead, Lauren. We're good. Okay, so let's say I'm a brand and I'm like... Okay, but I did this, right? I went mm -hmm. through a network experience and I just like didn't have, I didn't get affiliates, the affiliates I got, like they did like kind of a little bit of traffic. Said the test and never did. Right or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like yeah. I had, yeah, I got like a few sales, but it didn't actually make mm -hmm. an impact to my business enough for me to continue yeah. to invest strategy and resources. But like what you're talking about makes perfect sense. So what would be the actual motivation for me to try again? Like mm -hmm. what? Yeah, what? well, I think lots of times it, it, it's always, that's always hard because it, it could be different for different businesses. Maybe we'd have to know why it didn't work in the past. Oftentimes what I see is we approached with the wrong offer or the wrong strategy, which could happen anytime. Who's ever put up a Facebook ad and been like, that campaign bombed tremendously? 90% well, of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Could, so one of the things you have to remember is, uh, it's funny, I was just telling my son this the other day, he's been trying to skateboard. He's trying to teach, like, oh, learn the ollie. He came, he's really frustrated. Aww. He's like, I can't do a moving ollie. And I told him, I was like, well, dude, you've been doing, you've been trying for how long? Three days. I was like, <laughs> It is not, I was like, listen. I can't stand on the skateboard without dying. It's like, I have wheels on my feet. Well, I told him, I was like, I need you to shift your mentality. It's about a process, not about results. Skateboarding it's is being a function of failure <laughs> over and over and over again. Aww. But the process is what you believe in. And it's no different than where to affiliates. You might have gone on a network and there could have been a multitude of things in that process that maybe you didn't do correctly. I mean, I, I can't tell you what they all are. And if I was looking at your business, I could probably point those out. Um, but what we can tell you is that if you just stick to the process of pushing it, the results do come. They could be there. Now you have to might tweak and find things in your business, but there's huge potential in affiliate marketing and it's even growing. We're seeing it expand more and more and more because what did we see that happened over the pandemic? A ton of new entrants into online creation, whether it's businesses, whether it's content, there's a lot of people out there and not all of them are getting CPMs or not all of like they need to find something to promote, yeah. right? So it's a vast opportunity and it's only going to grow. So I think if you maybe got burned and think it just didn't work, why I put time in, I didn't get the results, um, stop focusing on the results and remember the process is what matters and go through that process just like you would any other campaign, knowing that the results will come if you do the process correctly. I feel like you need to be a life coach. <laughs> like I felt like, I got I'm it, I got it. I'm gonna start skateboarding. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. Uh, if the bad thing is I will get on there and like I wasn't a big skateboarder after I kick flip I was like I'm done this is my game <laughs> um, but it, like sometimes it's that death thing oh, I'll try it and I was like this is how I'm gonna tear an ACL my I know it's gonna happen yeah. um, I, but well uh, one thing I wanted to circle back on too is what you were talking about Thomas um, and I actually lost the point because Lauren asked that question <laughs> well so. no I, I'll jump in um, I was just gonna <laughs> circle back also <laughs> on this is that I love like how you put and what you said about it's not like you went through therapy and like you're learning your expectations, like you yeah. know what you want mm -hmm. out of a relationship and you're putting all of that on that affi affiliate resource page, affiliate tool page, whatever you you know want to call it. Tool page. Okay, um, I remember what I had. So, okay. <laughs> um, so that when you do launch your affiliate program on a network or you're starting to recruit affiliates, you ha are in control. Mm -hmm. You're like sitting in the power seat now, whereas before maybe you felt like, I'm not sure, I'm kind of dancing in this relationship, I'm gonna be passive. So I really like that approach where like you're, you're totally in control of your experience in affiliate marketing, which I think is kind of oftentimes the rub and yeah. oftentimes why you get burned because you're not fully sure of like exactly what you should be doing, mm -hmm. how is this supposed to be working, and it's just a waste of my time, I'm gonna bounce out. Yeah, because so really a lot to learn, right? Yeah. So it is like, a lot yeah. to learn. Well, let me bring yeah. it back to the relationship example. <laughs> if you were in a relationship and you were dating another partner and you expected them to just do it all, right? You need to be my perfect mate. I'm going to tell you, you're probably a crappy person to be in a relationship with. There's a good <laughs> chance it won't work out. It requires a bit of give and take. So I would tell you, if you're going to a network and expect them to work for you, your risk and likelihood of that going bad is going to be much higher. 
if you go into that situation to have a network work with you, so here's my goals, here's what I need, how can we work together? Success is so much more likely. So sometimes in a burning situation, maybe it is you. Yeah. You, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> You're the but problem. But I think that's, and then Probably one thing not. I want to circle back on the, um, the resource pages, you said, hey, why it's important to have. Um, Thomas mentioned it's B2B. There is a part of just looking the part. If you have a great looking resource page, an affiliate already thinks they seem to know what they're doing and the likelihood of conversions are higher. Plus, um, to, to quote um, our late friend Ed Scow, if treat affiliates like they're lazy, they have a lot going on. If you could accelerate their path to getting your offer out there and being successful, smart, good affiliates are going to do it much faster. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a performance marketer. If you're a content creator, if somebody just dumps a product and you have to figure out what to say, you're way less likely to promote that if somebody says, hey, here's some common post examples, here's verbiage that you could use, and here's even styles of videos oh my God. that have been successful. Yeah. I will jump and know, oh my gosh, this it's is so brain spin, easy. Right? Yeah, yeah. And they'll make it their own, and so it Plus reaches Plus they won't make audience. any errors. They won't make errors. They won't say something exactly. you don't want them or to. Or illegal, right? Yeah, yeah. If yeah. You, you, you put a weight loss supplement, someone's like, I'm gonna compare this to a Zembic. You're no. like, no, but, <laughs> but you didn't give them any way to not do that, right? So I think those are just some things that really those resources will improve in so many different ways. Yeah, I actually have like a real example that hopefully will help people relate to the conversation. Story time. Story time. Story time. <laughs> um, we have like popcorn effect. <laughs> <laughs> like that. that is not what popcorn sounds like. <laughs> 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 Bubbles. <so. laughs> um, so I'm working with two brands and we're working on um, like a pilot program for influencers. Mm -hmm. And one brand was able to provide everything that the influencers would need, which is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So campaign direction, style, images, um, examples, content do's, don'ts. Um, this is what we want. This is our expectations. This is our convert, you know, like yeah. the KPIs we're looking for. All those things that are so important to the influencer, but really to any affiliate. Um, then the, another brand ha didn't have that education or those types of, um, uh, I don't know how to explain. Like, Requirements or assets. Yeah, resources. Yeah. They didn't know that that was actually what is required to have something <laughs> move successfully. And so it was just that shift, right, of being able to understand that that's what, it, what, what we're talking about. That's I'm, I'm being so vague because I don't want to, like, <laughs> You're good. Sh uh, you know, share too much. But um, but once that, that brand did learn what was required of them and could provide the right information to the affiliates, it changed the entire experience with the influencers, um, with the content that they're going to get back. Oh, cool. So it's like yeah. what we're talking about isn't just – stuff to fill the air. It's like, it's real, it's tangible, it does make a difference. You will see the effects of being so diligent about um, the information you pro provide to your affiliates. Yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is a great way to put it. Now let's, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, Joe Polish has a quote, it's like, people want to do what's easy, lucrative, and fun, and they'll avoid what is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. So yeah. elf versus half, right? Mm -hmm. So if you make your brand easy, lucrative, and fun to work with to affiliates, you'll get a lot more out of it than, yeah. Totally. All that. So yeah. you're having struggles. It, I don't want to just victim blame and gaslight people. And it's all your fault, right? Because you could have been oversold. You could have been, right? It's yeah. Bad things could have actually happened. Mm -hmm. But we talk about how this, you can actually take control, build a program with intention, have clarity into your avatar on the customer side and the affiliate side, right? You can see how you can start to, you're almost not going to fail. It's more a matter of timing when you actually get established traction on how much you can execute against that plan. Yeah, no, beautifully said, beautifully said. And now let me fill the air with empty words about <laughs> relationships. We sing this in and bring it all back. But no, um, I, the really the big thing I think we people here hopefully we covered that. Yes, there's e there's lots of things that, like you said, might not have been your fault that could have caused bad experiences. Some could have been bad expectations set, and there could be some things on your far fault where you just didn't know, or your fart if you Is can't. Is it some excuse? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah. one of the big things we talk about it right now. I mentioned earlier, affiliates. It's a great opportunity that's only getting bigger. So you might have felt burned, you might have felt lost, you might feel like it's not for you, but I would tell you the time to try again is now. Jump back in, let spring fill you with hope as flowers bloom and love blossoms. You could also find that there's a network that you could fall in love with again. Now, one thing I'll say, and I'm gonna shamelessly plug ClickBank because we host this podcast, so why would I not? <laughs> that I think is amazing about a network and our network in particular is if you could find a network that's gonna work with you to give that advice, to give you the direction, to say, hey, why don't you try this? Yeah. Hey, 
this affiliate would be good, whatever it might be. To get that success, you'll find that maybe those relationships, that network isn't such a bad thing can really empower your business. So if you're a really great brand out there and you're thinking, I'm gonna jump back in, Lauren <laughs> should be someone you talk to or you could reach out to affiliated, or sorry, yeah, affiliated at clickbank.com. I always mix yeah. up our email. I don't know why. It's not it's hard. literally the title all. of the podcast <laughs> at clickbank.com. Um, but, but send us and say, hey, here's my brand. I got burned. Our affiliates are okay for me. We'd be happy to review yeah. that, look at it, give you some advice, um, and maybe even hop on a call yeah. with one of us, probably and hopefully Lauren, because she's way cooler and nicer than we are. So, <laughs> Definitely. Um, but with that, guys, I'd like to say thank you so much for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe, email us with your burn stories so we could convince you to come back onto networks again. And until next time, fall in love and have a great time. What do we tell people, Thomas? Well, I want to interject real fast. Oh, no. I already <laughs> closed it. it. Now it's what no, are we going to do now? I'm still going <laughs> to sign up. Don't worry. I just want to say the only reason we can speak the confidence to this is because. I know I've made all these mistakes on the sales side of things, right? I've set bad expectations in accident. I've overpromised and unintentionally. I've had clients pissed off because I wasn't delivering results for them. So like, I totally get it. <laughs> um, and the only reason we can speak to confidence and kind of know how these programs work is when we've seen this successful, we've onboarded hundreds of millions of dollars through our sales channels, right? And I've watched brands succeed and fail. And we can see the ones succeed, they operate a certain way. And that's what we're describing here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's a good point, Thomas. That's a good point. Unlike Thomas, I've never had any mistakes, but <laughs> no, <laughs> totally agree. Styles, yeah. totally agree. Yeah. no, no, totally agree. That's that's an amazing way to end it. So with that, Thomas, why don't you close it out with a favorite coined term that you use? Yeah, I'll say thank What's you for that? joining us again. Oh, Lauren. yes. Thank you for yeah. Lauren. Yeah. Sorry, Lauren. Yeah. You're here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. No, happy scaling. Thanks, guys.